Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. You would never expect hell to be in the Appalachian Mountains of Big Stone Gap, Virginia. And yet, that is exactly how the inmates of Wallens Ridge State Prison describe it. In an article from The Current, writer Edward Fitzpatrick paints a harrowing picture of this level 5 super maximum security prison. Located on the side of a cliff near an old coal mining town is a mountaintop fortress encircled by razor wire. This supermax prison houses up to 1,200 of the United States' most dangerous male criminals. Wallens Ridge opened in April of 1999 at the order of tough-on-crime then-Governor of Virginia George Allen. It was modeled after its sister penitentiary, Red Onion State Prison, which opened in 1998 and is located 30 miles north in Wise County, Virginia. Both prisons are almost 400 miles away from the most urban areas of Virginia, making it extremely difficult for families of inmates to visit their incarcerated loved ones. In 1994, Virginia abolished discretionary parole for felons. Subsequently, the number of incarcerated people skyrocketed. Wallens Ridge and Red Onion were built in the late 90s to handle the overwhelming spike in the prison population. However, while responding to the increase in incarcerated people, Virginia built too large of a prison. Now, inmates from all over the country, especially New Mexico and Connecticut, reside in Wallens Ridge. To this day, Virginia is especially strict about granting parole. When it first opened, Wallens Ridge was renowned for the violence it showed its inmates. Warning shots, rubber pellets, and stun guns were frequently used to scare and control their population. Fitzpatrick writes that Virginia officials are unapologetic about how they run Wallens Ridge. They believe using non-lethal weapons stops inmates from hurting each other and their staff. However, it's hard to measure the effectiveness of Wallens Ridge's techniques. They don't allow the media or the general public into the prison. Prison officials claim it's for protection purposes, but critics speculate that it may be to prevent public scrutiny. In a Washington Post article, writer Craig Timber quips that these prisons have taken the corrections out of the Virginia Corrections Department with 700 cells exclusively designated for 23-hour-a-day solitary confinement, there is no doubt that the focus of Wallens Ridge State Prison is punishment, not rehabilitation. Ronald Angelone, a 1999 corrections director involved in the creation of Wallens Ridge, explains that he designed it not to be a nice place. When questioned about rehabilitation efforts for inmates at the opening ceremony for Wallens Ridge's sister prison, Red Onion. Angelone responded, What are they going to be rehabilitated for? Let's face it, they're here to die in prison. In 2006, a documentary entitled Up the Ridge by Apple Shop filmmakers Nick Superla and Amelia Kirby highlighted the rampant human rights issues, including racism, that Wallens Ridge presents. Out of hundreds of corrections officers, a vast majority of them are white but the racial makeup of the inmates is much more diverse. According to current writer Edward Fitzpatrick, the Connecticut NAACP president once called Wallens Ridge's disparity between white corrections officers and inmates who are people of color a potential powder keg. More than simply being a harsh living and racially tense environment, Wallens Ridge has struggled with systemic issues like inmate violence, inmate suicide, and corrupt correctional officers. Investigative reporters and human rights organizations have expressed public concern regarding the questionable methods that Wallens Ridge employs. In response, Wallens Ridge plans to become a part of the Virginia Correctional Enterprise Program and is enacting changes to support its inmates better. Many supporters of the prison feel safer knowing that America's most dangerous are kept far away from populated areas in a near inescapable, if inhospitable, prison. And it is true that many inmates at Wallens Ridge have perpetuated horrific crimes. Christopher Gaddis is one of those inmates. On Thanksgiving Day of 2017, 
Christopher shot and murdered his wife, stepdaughter, and stepdaughter's boyfriend. Now, he is serving a life sentence at Wallens Ridge State Prison. Okay, on to the show. Christopher Raymond Gaddis was born on July 28, 1959, to parents James and Alina in Petersburg, Virginia. Christopher spent his entire life in the same eastern part of Virginia, five minutes away from his birthplace. Christopher attended Colonial Heights High School in Colonial Heights, Virginia. There, Christopher met his future wife, Jeanette. But it was the 1970s. They wouldn't marry until decades later after reconnecting at a high school reunion. In August 2008, 49-year-old Christopher married his high school classmate, 49-year-old Jeanette Coons. Before his marriage with Jeanette, Christopher had been married twice, first in 1980 to a woman named Carla. They divorced in 1998 after 18 years of marriage. Then in 1999, Christopher married his second wife, Kimberly. They divorced in 2003 after four years of marriage. To our knowledge, Christopher did not have children with any of his three wives. Christopher appeared to be a kind, albeit quiet man. People described him as selfless and gentle. Larry, Christopher's neighbor, said Christopher would do anything for you. He was always quick to laugh. But this persona was a front. While Christopher's violent nature was hidden to friends like Larry, he couldn't mask his anger 100% of the time. Christopher's criminal record illustrates he was always capable of harming others. In 2010, while married to Jeanette, Christopher was charged with misdemeanor public intoxication. Christopher paid a $25 fine and the charges were dropped. Christopher's friend suggested that he used to have a drinking problem but quit. But this isn't Christopher's only instance of concerning behavior. On September 5, 2012, a man named Kevin DeFord and his 19-year-old son were delivering newspapers. As was expected, DeFord's son threw a newspaper into Christopher's driveway as they circled the cul-de-sac in Kevin DeFord's vehicle. But when they passed by Christopher's house again, Christopher threw the newspaper into Kevin DeFord's open window. The newspaper hit Kevin in the face. DeFord's son exited the vehicle to confront Christopher, but Christopher threatened him with a box cutter. The son put his hands up and backed away. Kevin DeFord called the police. Luckily for Christopher, the case was dismissed after he apologized and paid DeFord approximately $1,000. And there's more. Eight News revealed that police had been dispatched to the Gaddis home seven times over eight years, from 2009 to 2017. One time, it was for a disturbance with a weapon. Despite his checkered past with local law enforcement, Christopher Gaddis seemed normal to outsiders. A friend of Christopher's stepdaughter said, The family appeared happy. The friend further explained, They were always posting pictures of just being together, cooking around the house, and always enjoying their time together. No one, not even Christopher's family members, spoke ill of him. By 2017, Christopher settled down in the town of Chester, Virginia, a suburb of Richmond. It's a small town of about 20,000 people, the kind of place where everyone knows everyone. For three years, Christopher had been a youth ministry director for Grace Lutheran Church. Before that, he'd worked for his family's business, Lighthouse Furniture and Appliance Company, Incorporated. A deacon at the church where Christopher worked described him as an excellent man. Unfortunately, this facade was not Christopher's true character. His wife, Jeanette, was a tragic victim to that fact. Jeanette Lynn Lau was born on July 16, 1959 in Hood, Texas, to parents Art and Wilma. She grew up in a somewhat religious home and was raised as a Lutheran with a German heritage. Jeanette was an intelligent woman. After attending high school with Christopher at Colonial Heights, She graduated from the College of William and Mary with a bachelor's degree in business administration. As an adult, Jeanette worked in the accounting department at Napier Realtors ERA for 15 years. Her colleagues described her as a dedicated and wonderful employee. 
In accordance with her upbringing, Jeanette continued to be a dedicated churchgoer. She was heavily involved at Grace Lutheran Church, where Christopher would later work, serving on their church council and various committees. Jeanette was well-loved by her friends and family. She was happy to host events and enjoyed having a good time. She was described as being bubbly, outgoing, loud, and fun. In May of 1984, 24-year-old Jeanette married a man named Holger Kuhns. After 16 years of marriage, they divorced in June of 2000. They had two children together, Adam and Candy. Adam and Candy both moved around the country quite a bit. Eventually, Adam would spend his adult years in Los Angeles. Candy would return to Virginia. In a seemingly fairy tale esque story, Jeanette reconnected with Christopher at a high school reunion. A friend would later describe the two as an excellent example of opposites attract. Christopher was introverted and soft-spoken, while Jeanette was outgoing and vivacious. Not long after rediscovering each other, the two were married on August 2, 2008 at Grace Lutheran Church, where Jeanette was an active church member and Christopher became the youth ministry director. Jeanette's son, Adam, explained that Jeanette and Christopher were happy for some time, but that there were also problems that came with the happiness. But, as is often true with marital issues, those problems weren't apparent to most. Friends viewed Jeanette and Christopher positively, explaining that they were good people. Only the family suspected the truth about Christopher. Candace Candy Lau Coons, Jeanette's daughter and Christopher's stepdaughter, was born on December 15, 1986. Similar to her mother, Candy was also a lively, bubbly person. Candy was an avid world traveler, even living in Singapore for a period of time. She had an indescribable zest for life and always tried to find beauty in the world. In her college years, Candy flourished. As a graduate student, she competed in 3MT, which is a competition for graduate students to present a compelling speech about their research and its significance in only three minutes. Candy received a Judge's Choice Award and made it to later rounds of the competition. In 2016, 29-year-old Candy received her doctorate from Radford University and became a traveling physical therapist. In 2017, Candy began dating a man named Andrew Buthorn. Andrew Ellis Buthorn was born to parents Bill and Nancy on March 18, 1981. He was raised in Olympia, Washington, where he graduated from Olympia High School in 1999. At that point, he moved across the country to Arlington, Virginia to attend Marymount College, where he played college golf. Andrew was an accomplished athlete, and golf was his favorite sport. Besides sports, Andrew had a lot of varied interests. He loved to play his guitar, ride bikes, drink beer, and coffee, and read about history, especially the Civil War. He was a likable, talented man with remarkable enthusiasm for life. In an interview, Andrew's father described him as unique, egg-headed, outgoing, caring, funny, kind, and someone who wanted to serve his fellow humans. It's easy to see why Candy would fall for him. After he graduated from Marymount with his bachelor's degree in history, he returned to Washington for his doctorate in physical therapy from the University of Puget Sound. From there, Andrew became a traveling contract physical therapist. He moved to Eugene, Oregon for his first physical therapy job. That's where he met Candy. Candy and Andrew were the loves of each other's lives. Near 2016, they met at a continuing education workshop for physical therapists. By March of 2017, just one year later, the two were dating. Andrew's mother Nancy said there was an immediate connection between Candy and Andrew. Soon after their first date, everyone knew their relationship was special. Nancy described them as two peas in a pod. The couple was smitten and would light up when the others walked into the room. Plus, Nancy really liked Candy. Nancy knew with certainty that the two were destined to get married. In September of 2017, Andrew and Candy moved to Virginia. They planned to find work as traveling physical therapists somewhere in the area. For two weeks, Andrew and Candy lived with Christopher and Jeanette in Chester, Virginia. 
Andrew got a job at a nursing home in Winchester, which was only a few hours away from Chester. At this point, Andrew moved to Winchester while Candy remained living with Jeanette and Christopher. Although it's unclear why Candy didn't go with Andrew, it was probably for ease, since they moved so often for work. Regardless, Andrew returned to Chester to see Candy for Thanksgiving. On his drive to Chester for the holiday, Andrew called his mother Nancy. He told her that he and Candy were moving to Yuma, Arizona for their next traveling physical therapy job. Christopher did not share Nancy's positive feelings about his stepfather and her boyfriend, especially regarding their stay in his home. He was mad that Andrew and Candy had lived with him and Jeanette for several weeks, and that Candy continued to live with them. Christopher had a history of getting angry if Jeanette's children stayed longer than a few days. On Tuesday, November 21st, 2007, two days before Thanksgiving, the family played board games at Christopher and Jeanette's house. 30-year-old Candy, 36-year-old Andrew, 58-year-old Jeanette, 59-year-old Christopher, and Christopher's adult nephew were all there. Christopher was drinking. An argument broke out because Christopher was furious that Candy and Andrew were, once again, staying at his house for longer than a few days. In a fit of fury, Christopher shoved his wife Jeanette and pulled back his fist as if he were going to hit her. Just in time, Christopher's nephew stepped in. No one was hurt. Later that same evening, Jeanette retrieved Christopher's gun. She gave it to his nephew, who was spending the night. Jeanette explained to the nephew, I'm scared he's going to use this. Ultimately, Jeanette only gave the nephew one of Christopher's many guns. If you've been experiencing symptoms and don't know where to start, Everly Well is committed to listening and supporting your journey towards better health and wellness. I'm personally doing the metabolic test, and it's so simple to take. Everly Well ships the product straight to my home, all in one package. I just have to prick my finger and collect a little blood sample for testing. Since a prepaid shipping label is included, it's as easy as putting it in the mail and waiting for my lab results, which our physician reviewed. And they get sent to my phone in just a couple of days. Everly Well services are quick, convenient, and bring me such peace of mind as I learn more about my body and how it works. So both I and any primary healthcare physicians can tailor my healthcare to my needs. And for listeners of our show, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash tcfc. That's everlywell.com slash tcfc for 20% off your next at-home lab test. Remember, everlywell.com slash tcfc. As Tuesday and Wednesday passed, Christopher became increasingly angry. On Thanksgiving evening at 6 o'clock p.m., Candy and Andrew were enjoying the hot tub in Christopher and Jeanette's backyard. Suddenly, Christopher yelled at Candy and Andrew. He was enraged. Christopher told them they had to leave immediately. Jeanette heard Christopher and began recording Christopher's tantrum on her phone. At this point, the phone recording showed Christopher turning his attention to Jeanette and yelling at her. Following the argument, Christopher went upstairs to his bedroom. After a few hours, at 9.40 p.m., Christopher sent Jeanette a slew of weird text messages while he was in the bedroom. His text said, Please, please stop threatening me. I am so scared. Please leave me alone. I am in fear of my life. I feel you want to kill me. Please let me live. A minute later, he texted, I just want to live. Please, please. Over the next hour, he continued to send texts. They read, Stop telling me you want to kill me. Stop scaring me. I am so afraid. You're hurting me. Please don't come in my room to hurt me. Please don't come after me. Thanks. And you want to hurt me. I'm so scared. You and Candy want to kill me. Jeanette was confused and concerned. As Christopher's text escalated in intensity, 
Jeanette texted Christopher's nephew, who wasn't at the house at this time, and expressed her worry. Their text conversation began at 10.48 p.m. She wrote, He's over the edge. We have left him alone. We'll send you his last text. I think he's doing mind games. The nephew replied to Jeanette in a series of texts that said, What in the world? Please be careful. I don't know what he's doing, but I think you two should stay somewhere else if you can. The nephew also said, This is a very strange message. I don't believe he's scared at all. I don't know why he would say that. I won't message him. For Candy, Andrew, and your sake, I really think you two should stay somewhere else. By 11.06 p.m., Christopher was no longer texting Jeanette. Ten minutes later, at 11.15 p.m., Candy and Andrew were playing another board game in the kitchen. 58-year-old Christopher retrieved one of his guns and ammunition, a Taurus 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol, and three fully loaded magazines. Christopher went downstairs to the kitchen. He proceeded to open fire. First, Christopher shot Jeanette once in the back. Then, he shot Candy multiple times in the back, chest, upper torso, and right thigh. Andrew tried to escape, but Christopher shot him three times as he ran. At least one shot entered Andrew's stomach. Christopher emptied the guns 11 rounds. He left one fully loaded magazine on the kitchen floor and another in his pocket. Fifteen minutes after slaying his wife, stepdaughter, and stepdaughter's boyfriend, Christopher contacted his home alarm company. He told them to send police, but he wouldn't say why he needed them. At 11.30 p.m., about three minutes after Christopher contacted his alarm company, police officer N.C. Frazier arrived at the scene. Frazier had no understanding of what he would see, because Christopher didn't tell the alarm company what was wrong. For all Frazier knew, he was responding to a standard, check the bushes please, house alarm call. Frazier found Christopher sitting on the front steps of the Gaddis home. Andrew, who had attempted to flee, and so was out of the kitchen, was dead three feet away from Christopher. As Frazier approached the house, Christopher said that Andrew had threatened him, Observing the severity of the crime scene, Frazier had Christopher lie face down on the ground with his hands behind his back. From there, he handcuffed him. Frazier did not read Christopher his Miranda rights immediately. Frazier justified this by saying he was detaining Christopher without placing him under arrest because he was attempting to get an understanding of the situation before reading Christopher his rights. Frazier went to Andrew's body and lifted up his shirt. He saw that Andrew was shot and unresponsive. Then, Frazier asked Christopher how many people were shot. Christopher said, three, two inside the house and Andrew in the front yard. Frazier asked Christopher why he shot them, and Christopher said, they kept threatening me. They threatened to kill me. After hearing this information, Frazier read Christopher his Miranda rights. As per his Miranda rights, Christopher could have chosen to remain silent but he did not. He told Frazier that the two people inside were probably all dead. They all came after me. Frazier asked Christopher if he'd been drinking, and Christopher confirmed that he had three drinks. Then Christopher confirmed to Frazier that he'd shot everyone when they all ganged up on him. Frazier's body cam recorded the entire encounter between him and Christopher. Later, this would become key evidence in Christopher's trial. Realizing he had a triple homicide on his hands, Frazier called for backup. When more law enforcement arrived, the officers entered the Gaddis house, where they found the gun lying on a table just inside the front door. Authorities found the video Jeanette took of Christopher arguing with her, Candy, and Andrew by the hot tub. They also discovered that Candy's phone had been recording when Christopher began his shooting spree. In the recording, you can hear screaming, and briefly see Andrew behind a table, begging for his life. Andrew said, I will go out. I will leave. Police also recovered the weird text messages Christopher had sent before killing his family. Christopher was charged with three counts of first-degree murder and three counts of using a firearm in the commission of a felony. He was held without bond and was placed on suicide watch. Upon his arrest, Christopher's workplace, the Grace Lutheran Church, suspended him without pay. 
Later, Adam, Jeanette's son and Candy's brother, who was living in Los Angeles, was informed of their deaths. While he was initially in shock, Adam said he soon began connecting the dots. He explained his suspicions of Christopher by saying, It's almost like I already knew what had happened and by whom. There was something deep down that was not surprising. Jeanette and Candy's funerals were held at Grace Lutheran Church on December 2, 2017. Andrew's funeral was held at St. Michael Catholic Church on December 2, 2017, in his birthplace of Olympia, Washington. On June 25, 2018, Christopher's defense attorneys attempted to suppress the incriminating statements Christopher made to police officer Frazier when he first arrived on the scene. The defense claimed that whatever Christopher told Frazier was before he was read his Miranda rights and should not be allowed into trial evidence. Frazier countered by testifying that he was trying to understand the situation before arresting Christopher. The prosecution argued that in an emergency situation, a suspect can be handcuffed and placed into an investigative detention prior to an officer reading a person his rights. The judge ruled in the prosecution's favor. They could use Christopher's incriminating confession. With no other options, Christopher pled guilty to three counts of first-degree murder and one count of felony use of a firearm on August 15, 2018, less than a year after he murdered Jeanette, Candy, and Andrew. The other two counts of felony use of a firearm were dropped. The prosecution built a timeline of the days leading up to Christopher's killing spree, as well as the events of Thanksgiving Day. They theorized that Christopher planned the murders and sent the odd text messages to Jeanette, Candy, and Andrew to falsely establish that he feared for his safety. Christopher's defense attorney said that Christopher admitted to killing all three victims. However, his attorney posited that Christopher killed them out of self-defense. He submitted a photo of bruises on Christopher's chest as evidence, saying the bruises were from Jeanette. According to his attorney, Jeanette had assaulted Christopher during their argument two days before Thanksgiving. As a result, Christopher's anger built up over 48 hours. Then, Christopher encouraged Candy and Andrew to leave to defuse the situation. Christopher texted Andrew the message, I'm sorry you stepped into a bad situation, which appears to reference ongoing family conflicts that Andrew, the boyfriend, was unwittingly caught in. The defense attorney's justifications of Christopher's murders continued as he explained that after the arguments outside the hot tub, Christopher went upstairs to his bedroom, but could apparently still hear Jeanette, Candy, and Andrew belittle him from the hot tub outside. No one bought this story. Christopher was sentenced to 100 years for each first-degree murder charge and three years for the firearm charge. After Christopher's sentence, Adam, Jeanette's son, and Candy's brother said that he and Andrew's family were satisfied with the sentence. They felt... Justice was done, since Christopher would spend the rest of his life in prison. As of today, Christopher is incarcerated in Wallens Ridge State Prison and will remain there for the rest of his life. Following this horrific murder, Andrew's parents have become close to Candy's father, Holger Coons. Andrew's mother, Nancy, said that they are all family now. Okay, fan club members. As I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you like our podcast, please review us on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. We truly appreciate it. Follow us on our social media. We're active on Twitter at TCFC Pod, Facebook at Facebook.com slash TCFC Podcast, and Instagram at True Crime Fan Club Pod. Our website is truecrimefanclub.com, and we'd love to hear your episode suggestions. Send us an email at tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was researched by Haley Gray and written by Andrea Marshbank. Content editing by Brittany Martinez. Produced by Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check them out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com. Production assisted by Jesse Hawk. 